today we are going to be talking about basic scheduling with AON networks. In our last lecture we had talked about basic scheduling with activity on ARC networks. So today the focus is activity on node networks. You already know the difference between activity on ARC and activity on node networks. As you know that they are alternative project representations. In the activity on ARC representation, which is also known as arrow diagrams in common parlance or also known as event oriented networks, what happens is that the job is represented on the arrow and the <coughs> nodes have the interpretation of events. That is why these are called event oriented networks and the forward pass and the backward pass computations in AOA networks actually have the interpretation of event times or uh, milestones here. On the other hand in the activity on node representation which are also known as precedence networks, these networks are actually activity oriented networks. So each activity or the node here represents the job and the arrows are representing in fact the precedence relationships. There are certain features of scheduling with AON networks. For instance, what one can see is that uh, basic scheduling computations that is determination of the schedule and the critical path for the project can be done on both the AOA and the AON networks. The AON networks are generally much simpler to draw. As you saw, the AON networks do not require any logical dummies and they are much simpler given the activities and their predecessor relationships. You can immediately draw the network without any problems and uh, that is one reason why most computer networks or computer packages like MS project and others, they tend to draw AON networks or precedence networks. And however, the disadvantage is that they lack intuitive workflow interpretation of the AOA networks, which means that uh, in the AOA network, as you progress along the arc, it is like uh, doing the job. It's like job being done, it's being started to the job being completed. So it's like uh, an intuitive workflow interpretation as you progress on the network. That kind of an interpretation is missing in the AON framework. However, we also noticed that there were some kind of anomalies in uh, using the four floats when we represented the project as an AOA network. This depended upon where you place the dummy, whether the dummy was preceding the network, preceding the arc or the dummy was placed after the arc. However, there are no such float anomalies in AON networks. AON networks as I said are becoming more popular in computer packages and uh, these networks lead easily to a method of programming known as PDM or precedence diagramming methods which actually work with expanded precedence relationships rather than the conventional precedence relationships and there are four types of relationships finish to start, finish to finish, start to start and start to finish. So with these additional lead lag factors, we can do uh, scheduling with AON networks. Let us now take an example and see how scheduling can be done with AON networks. So here is a project which has these, this job description. This is the predecessor set and the durations and days for each of the jobs a, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, they are given as shown here. Now you know that from the predecessor information, we can in fact draw the AON network without any difficulty because there would be a node corresponding to each job and the predecessor relationships would in fact be shown on the network by means of arrows. So we can see in fact that this particular network, that this particular, in this particular example, the AON network can be drawn as shown in this particular diagram. Now what you see here is that A and B 
are two jobs which have no predecessors and as far as job D is concerned it has predecessors A and B and these are shown here and similarly the predecessors of job C is, is job A so you have an arrow from job C to A in this particular manner and then we have the complete AON network as shown in this particular diagram. So you will notice that we have not used any dummies at all in this representation and uh, what we have in this particular uh, network is we have two source nodes. These are two source nodes because they have no predecessor arcs and similarly this is a sync node because we have three arcs coming into the node I but there are no arcs emanating from node I. So there are two sources, one sync and the numbers adjacent to each node here represent the arc duration, right. So job A has a duration of two days, job B has a duration of three days and so on. The job durations of each of the jobs are in fact shown in this particular network. So what we are now going to do is basically perform the forward pass and the backward pass computations on this network. Notice that we do not have an event interpretation at all. We have the jobs which have durations which are given here. So what we are actually going to compute is the early start and the early finish of activities which is obtained by a forward pass and the late start and the late finish of activities which is obtained by a backward pass. Now before we actually do the forward and the backward pass for this particular network, let us see <coughs> sorry, what would be the general uh, manner in which a forward pass would be conducted. For any network, a forward pass on an AON network begins with a stage of initialization. That is the first step and initialization is actually the step where we say that the early start or ES of all the beginning activities, beginning activities meaning those activities which have no predecessors, so the source nodes. So this is equal to 0 or it is equal to the start date S of the project as the case may be. So this is the process of initialization for the forward pass. Having done this, what we then do is we make this computation. We say that the knowing the early start of uh, any activity, the early finish of the activity can be computed simply as the early start plus the duration of the activity. So it is as simple as that the early finish is equal to early start plus the duration of the activity. Now having done this what we can do is let us see what would be how we would be computing in general for an activity J the early start and the early finish. The early start and the early finish are computed for activity J simply by looking at the predecessor activities. Suppose this activity J has one two and so on up to p predecessors. Then we have already computed <coughs> by virtue of the previous steps the early start and early finish for each of these activities. So what we have to simply do is we have to take the early start of activity J as the maximum of the early finish of all predecessors. So you look at this number which is the early finish of these particular activities and we compute the early start for this activity. And once the early start is computed, the early finish is then computed by adding the duration to this activity. So we can obtain the early start and the early finish for a forward pass. Now just to illustrate this procedure, let us go back to our example and see how we would be doing a forward pass on the network. So going back to the example, let us now do a forward pass for the example. This is our network. Let us uh, take for instance the uh, initialization step for this particular example. So what you find is what I am going to do is A and B are the two activities which do not have any predecessors. So they are the beginning activities. So they can start in fact at time 0. So this can start at time 0 and this also can start at time 0. And moreover, 
this particular activity has a duration of 2. So, it is uh, early finish will be 2 and the early finish for this activity will be 3. So, I can put these in a rectangular box at the top of each of these activities. So, remember that the first number is the early start and the second number is the early finish of the activity. Now, let us see what, what happens. Let us uh, take activity C. Activity C has only one predecessor. So, there is no problem. The early start of this is going to be simply 2 and since it is a duration of 1, its early finish is going to be simply 3. So, the early start and the early finish for activity C in the forward pass is simply going to be 2 and 3 respectively. <coughs> Let us look at activity D. Activity D has two predecessors. So, what you have to do is simply look at these early finish times. The larger of the two is 3. So, this is simply 3 and the duration of this activity is 4. So, 3 plus 4 is 7. So, the early start and early finish of activity D can be determined in this manner. It is 3 and 7. Okay. Now, let us find out the early start and early finish for the, the uh, subsequent activities. For activity E for instance, it will be just 7 and 12. This is the early start and early finish for activity E. For activity F, it is simply going to be 7 and 15. This is the early start and early finish of this. Now, take activity G. Activity G has multiple, it has two predecessors. So, you have got to take the maximum of 3 and 12 in this particular case. So, this is going to be 12 and it has a duration of 6. So, the early finish for this particular job is going to be 18. So, 12 and 18 is the early start and early finish for job G. For job H which has these two predecessors, the larger of the two is 12. So, 12 and 16 is going to be the early start and early finish for job H. Now, we come to this terminal job I. It has three predecessors G, H and F and the larger of the early finish values which are already computed is 18. So, this will have an early finish of 18 and then it has a duration of 3. So, its early finish is going to be 21. So, since now we have obtained the early start and early finish of all the jobs in the, the forward pass is now complete. And what you can see from this particular forward pass is that the project duration will be 21. That is the critical path in this particular project will have a duration of 21 days. And uh, however, we would like to do a backward pass and be able to identify the various floats as we had done for the AOA network, but in this case for the AON network. Let us see how we can do that. What we can do next is, let us see the mechanism for doing a backward pass. The backward pass also would require an initialization step, just as the forward pass required an initialization step. And in this initialization, what we simply do is that the project duration t is equal to, is put equal to the maximum of the early finish of all ending jobs, right. So, there could be multiple sinks in a network. One job could be ending at time 15, the other could be ending at 20, third could be ending at 23. So, whichever is the maximum, the maximum of the early finish of all ending jobs will determine the project duration. In the example that we were considering, there was only one sink. So, there was no. So, but in a general situation, this is the operation that would have to be performed. And then what we do is, we initialize by saying that the latest finish of all ending jobs must be equal to t, which is the project duration, which we have determined in that manner. And then what we do is, once we have determined the latest finish of a job, the latest start of a job is simply latest finish minus the duration we are working backwards. And having done that, we say for instance, that the latest finish of a job 
Mind you, we are writing the latest start and the latest finish at the bottom of the node. And we have written the early start and the early finish at the top of the node. It's convenient to adopt this convention so that you can identify the numbers that you are computing on the network. Here what we do is, the late start and the late finish has been computed for all the successor nodes of the activity. So what we simply have to do is, the latest start is what we are interested in. So look at this latest start for each of the successors and do the minimum and that minimum will become the latest finish of this particular activity. And from the latest finish you can determine the latest start simply by subtracting the duration. Okay. Now let us try to do this computation for the network. For the network we have already determined the times the early start and the early finish times corresponding to each of the jobs. So what we can do is, let us look at the, let us try to do a backward pass on this example. So we start with the ending node. You know the project duration for this particular example is 21. So we will say that the latest finish of node i is 21 and 21 minus 3 is 18. So the numbers that I am showing you in red reflect nothing but the latest finish and the latest start of the activities. So we can put them down like I have shown them here. Then for instance we can come to activity F. So when I come to activity F what do I do? I have to simply this 18 directly gets transferred here and 18 minus 8 would be 10. Right? This is the latest start and the latest finish for activity F. For activity H, what would be the corresponding values? There is only one successor for activity H. So this is simply going to be 18 and this is going to be 14 because the duration of this particular activity is 4. Then you come to activity G. Say if you take activity G for instance, let us see what is the situation for activity G. This is 18, the latest finish for this activity must be 18 and 18 minus 6 will give me 12 here. Now I have determined the late start and finish for I, G, H and F. Let us try to determine this for activity E. Notice that activity E has two successors. G and H. So what I have to do is I have to take the minimum of 12 and 14 and this is going to be the latest finish for activity E. And in order to determine the latest start for activity E, 12 minus 5 which is going to be 7. So this is the latest start and finish for activity E. Let us do the analysis for activity C. Activity C again has two successors G and H. The minimum value that I have obtained from these is 12 and 12 minus 1 is 11. So the latest start and finish for activity C is going to be 11 and 12 respectively. Right? Now talk, talk about activity D. Activity D also has two successors E and F. The lower value is 7 and the, the duration is 4, so this value is going to be 3, right? And what you can see from this is that as far as uh, job A is concerned, it has two successors again, 11 and 3 being the latest start times. So this is going to be 3 and this is going to be 1 and this is going to be the late start and late finish of job A. And similarly, when you come to activity B, this is going to be simply 0 and 3. So we have now completed a backward pass on the network and a forward pass also. Incidentally, you can see from this that those activities for which the early start is equal to late start, early finish is equal to late finish, those are the activities which have no float at all. And those are the critical activities. So the critical activities in this case are B is a critical activity. 
right? This is a critical activity, D is a critical activity, then E is a critical activity, then G is a critical activity and then I is a critical activity. Other activities are not critical in this particular. What we can do is we can very easily compute the total float because the total float is nothing but the late start minus the early start or the late finish minus the early finish. So this computation can be done. For instance, activity A has a total float of 1 and activity B has a total float of 0, it being a critical activity. So from these computations, we can actually make a table of floats. And we find out that for this particular example, activity A has a float of 1, activity C has a float of 9, total float of 9, F has a total float of 3 and H has a total float of 2, the other activities are in fact critical. <coughs> so these critical activities which we, can, uh, which we can identify are, as I indicated to you, they are very easy to identify. We have uh, the critical activities are simply those activities which have, for which the early start and late start are equal. So this is, this particular activity B is a critical activity. D is a critical activity, E is a critical activity, G is a critical activity and I is a critical activity. The other activities are not critical because they have a uh, certain amount of total float which is greater than 0. So the critical path for this particular example can be shown more clearly here. The critical path for this particular example is B, D, E, G, I. And uh, the other non-critical activities are A, C, H and F as shown from this particular uh, representation. Now since we have already determined the early start and the late start schedules for each activity, we can represent that information on a Gantt chart and we can get a timetable for all the activities. And that timetable would be shown something like this. The activities which are critical are shown in this manner. So B is a critical activity and then D is a critical activity and then E is a critical activity and then G is a critical activity and this is a critical activity and they cannot be slided to and fro. Whereas activities A, C, F and G, these are non-critical activities and in fact the latest finish of these activities is shown here by means of this. So this activity can in fact be slided up to this particular point and uh, without delaying the project. Similarly, this activity C, has a, which has a total float of 9, can be slided up to this particular point and without delaying the project and so on for these activities. So this gives you a timetable and also shows you the kind of flexibility which is available when you have to implement the project. You know that the critical activities in this particular situation, all these durations add up to the critical path duration of 21 days all the critical activities are adding up to the critical path duration of 21 days. I think that's one of the interesting things that you, that's an interpretation in fact of the critical path. Now, we have not been able to compute so far all the four kinds of floats. You know that uh, from the AOA representation we showed that uh, float in general it depends upon how the predecessors and the successors of the activity are accommodating the activity. And so we in fact had talked about four kinds of floats. And uh, these four kinds of floats were, if you recall, the total float which actually happens when the predecessors are done as early as possible and the successors of the activity are done as late as possible so that the maximum leeway is available to that particular activity. So that is the total float and uh, the reverse is the situation with the independent float when the predecessors are delayed as much as possible and the successors want to get started as early as possible and then you have the independent float if at all it exists in this particular situation. And uh, if you have the predecessors being done at the early, earliest possible and the successors being done at the earliest possible so that you are not eating into the float of the successors then this is called a free float. And the safety float has the interpretation when the predecessors get late 
and you are allowing the successes to get delayed, so you have these. So by using this basic interpretation of the four kinds of floats, we find that the computation of the total float in the AON network was rather straightforward and we have determined this. We will see how the others can be determined and we are going to basically use this kind of framework. Now how the computations can be done for the computation of the float here, if we look at the a general activity J for which we have computed all these figures, basically in the AON network we are computing the early start and the early finish which are obtained from the forward pass, the late start and the late finish which are obtained from the backward pass and we say that we have this information compiled. Now what we really need to do is you can see that the early start and early start is in fact having the same interpretation as the uh, in the AOA network if you have an activity IJ then the earliest occurrence time of the predecessor node EI is nothing but ES the earliest start of the activity right that is how you determine EI that is rather how you determine the early start of the activity you calculate the early start of the activity by putting it equal to EI. So this is nothing but EI and by the same logic ELF is nothing but LJ of the corresponding AOA network, right. So we have these two, this is the predecessor node earliest occurrence time, this is the successor node latest occurrence time in the corresponding AOA network and to compute the floats what we need to actually compute is the node slacks that is we need to compute the li minus ei that is the slack on the predecessor node and the slack on the successor node. So how we can do that is very simple. In this case we say slack on the preceding node in the corresponding AOA representation is nothing but we have this all the predecessor jobs for this particular activity we will take the maximum of the late finish of jobs. So the numbers which are shown at the bottom of the activity of the predecessors, we look at all these numbers and what we try to do is simply we try to look at this number, we try to look at this number and we try to look at all these numbers, the latest finish of all the jobs and we try to take the maximum of these numbers. So the maximum of the latest finish of all predecessors would have the interpretation of Li on the AOA network and this is ES is nothing but your EI. So Li minus EI would be in fact the slack on the preceding node which we are looking for. So this is the point you need actually for all the predecessors you would need the LF value of the predecessors you can uh, perform these computations. Similarly if we have to find out the slack on the succeeding node, we have LJ all right which is LF, we need we, sorry we have LJ, we need EJ, the earliest occurrence time would be nothing but the earliest start of the successors. So you look at the successors and you find out the first value here, this particular value here. In fact we look at this particular value, we look at this particular value and we look at this particular value here. And what we do is all these values we find out the uh, minimum of these and the minimum of these minimum of the ES of successors would in fact give me nothing but the uh, EJ value corresponding in the corresponding AOA representation. So I have a means of computing the slack on the preceding node by using this particular formula and the slack on the succeeding node by using this particular formula. And mind you this particular representation comes from that uh, basic uh, interpretation of the various kinds of floats that we just tried to see. So what we can then do is by using this interpretation we can in fact compute all the floats for the example. And this computation for all the floats for the total float, the safety float, the free float and the independent float for the entire example is shown here. Notice that activities which were critical that is B for them all the four kinds of floats are 0. So B, D, E, G, 
and I. These were critical activities. For them actually all we do not have to actually compute all the floats, they would be 0. However, for each non-critical activity, you can compute the uh, safety free and independent floats in the manner that I just indicated to you. For instance, just to show you how these computations are performed, let us take activity A in the network. Activity A, I have isolated the activity A and notice that activity A is a beginning activity, it has no predecessors. It has two successors and these successors are C and D. So, what I have noted down here is the early start values, early start and early finish, early start and early finish of successors, that is all I need right for the activity. So, the total float for this activity is nothing but latest start latest start is 1 minus early start or latest finish minus early finish which is this particular value. So, this is 1 the total float. The safety float for this particular example will be the total float minus the, the total float we have already computed it is going to be minus the slack on the preceding node. So, this is maximum of LF of predecessors minus ES. So, when you take the predecessors in this particular case, this is a beginning activity, it has no predecessors, so this particular value is 0 and early start for this activity is 0, so the safety float for this activity is 1. Let us now compute the free float for this activity. You see that the total float minus the node slack on the successors in the corresponding AOA representation is given by LF, the latest finish for this activity is simply 3 right this we have computed already minus the minimum of the early start of successors minimum of so I have only the for the successors I have the early start information. So, minimum of 2 and 3 is 2. So, this is 2. So, 1 minus 3 minus 2 is 0. So, the free, free float for this activity is 0. Similarly, the independent float is nothing but total float minus both the latter terms that is this term and this term both 0 and 1. So, 0 plus 1 is, so this is 0. So, we have computed all the floats for this particular activity. For clarity or for further demonstration, we can look at each of the non-critical activities and show you how the float is computed. Let us see for instance activity C. When you see activity C, this is an activity which has both predecessors and successors, right. So, this is the activity early start, early finish, late start, late finish. For the predecessors, I have got the late start and late finish information. I do not need the other information. So, I have only taken the relevant information. And for the successors, I need only the early start, early finish representation. So, what I need to do is the total float for this activity is simply 11 minus 2, which is 9. And the safety float is nothing but 9, which is the total float minus the maximum of the latest finish of predecessors. Uh, maximum of the latest finish of predecessor. There is only one predecessor here and that predecessor has a maximum uh, latest finish time of 3. So, 3 minus the early start of the activity which is 2. So, the safety float for this activity is 8 by this logic. And similarly, when you are computing the free float for this particular activity, this will be total float minus late finish minus minimum of the early start of successors. How are you going to compute the early start of successes? These are the two successes. The minimum of these two values it happens to be 12. So, 12 the latest finish for this activity happens to be 12. So, 12 minus 12 is 0. So, 9 minus 0 is 9. So, this is 0 and this is 1. So, 1 plus 0 you subtract both of them from 9 and you get the independent float which is 8. So, we have 9, 8, 9, 8 for activity C. In fact, something similar could be attempted for activity F. Activity F of course, was a unique activity which had only one predecessor and one successor. So, the minimand and the maximand would be a very trivial thing for this activity, right. So, we are having here the total float which is the maximum of the late finish of predecessors which will be 7, 7 minus 7 the early start of this activity is 7 and the free float will be total float minus latest finish the latest finish of this particular latest finish of this activity is 18 minus the minimum of the early start of successors 
and there is only one successor. So this is 18. So this is 3. So all these, uh, all the four floats in this particular situation come out to be equal. They are in this particular situation shown as, as shown here. Similarly for activity H, H had two predecessors and one successor. So knowing the information which was available from the forward pass, we could in a similar manner compute all the information for this particular activity H in the manner that we computed here. And here again as you notice for activity H, the latest start is 14, the early start is 12, so the total float is 2 and when you are computing the safety float, you have to take from the total float the maximum of the latest finish of predecessors. So latest finish of predecessors is 12 and 12. You have to take the maximum of that which is 12 minus the early start of the activity which is 12 itself. So you get this particular value. Similarly, the free float is the total float which is 2 minus the uh, late finish of the activity, the late finish of the activity is 18, 18 minus minimum of the early start of successors, there is only one successor, so the early start of that successor is 18, so this is 2 and similarly since these values are coming out 0, the independent float will actually be equal to 2, so in this case also all the four floats are coming out equal. You would recall that H was an activity in the corresponding AOA network which had a dummy preceding it and this was an activity for which we had discovered anomalies in the computations of the four floats. Now here there are no such uh, complications and in this case we get all the four floats as equal for activity H. Now this after having talked about the basic uh, the basic uh, scheduling in AON networks, we are going to be talking about a very important class of you could say uh, specialization of AON networks known as precedence diagramming methods. Now in precedence diagramming what happens really is it is essentially an activity on uh, node relationship but we have generalized precedence relationships. The only kind of precedence relationships that is possible in a conventional AON network or in an AOA network is the finish to start relationship. That is an activity must be finished before the successor activity can start or a set of activities must be finished before the next activity can take place. Now what has been argued is that there could be more relations than just this relationship and in fact there is a possibility that a number of activities might take place concurrently. You want a number of activities to take place concurrently but not totally concurrently but you might want to build in some constraints. So let us see what kinds of constraints can be built in and how do we do the programming here. Four kinds of uh, lead lag relationships are possible. You can constrain either the start to start of an activity or the finish to finish of the activity or the start to finish of the activity or the finish to start of the activity. You see there are only two possibilities. Uh, you are constraining in start to start after an activity starts some time after that minimum time after that you might want to start a the next activity but you might not wait for the finish of that activity. Imagine for instance that you are doing you are laying a large plastering a large piece of road and uh, what you would do is that you would probably like to lay all the concrete first and then do the plastering once the concrete is over. Now you need not necessarily wait for the whole thing to be for the concrete to set. If it is a long uh, wall you can say that the first portion once it is leveled you can start uh, doing the plastering activity on that portion itself and then continue with that activity subsequently, right. So you can then if you want to impose a restriction there you can use an SS lag. So an SS lag means if I specify an SS lag it would say that the start of the plastering can start after the start of the pouring of the concrete 
after maybe 5 hours if I specify a time of 5 hours in that sense and most of these activities can take place in parallel. Something similar is possible with a finish to finish lag or a start to finish lag or a finish. In fact, the conventional networks have only a finish to start lag with an FS value equal to 0. Right? You finish something and then you start. So, the major uh, advantage here is that you are permitting partial or complete overlap of activities. That is the major advantage in precedence uh, diagramming networks. Let us look at the four types of lags before we take an example. For instance, if you have a start to start lag, you see basically what happens is we have one activity, let us call this activity as u and we have another activity, let us call this activity as v and we would like to retain a partial overlap between these. If we were doing the conventional situation, then uh, one activity will start only when this is finished. But what happens now is, you can see that there are essentially uh, a start to start lag means essentially that this particular interval is called the SS lag which you specify. So, by specifying a certain lag, if this is specified as 4 days, what it means is that the start of activity V will take place at least 4 days after the start of A. It is the constraint is only on the start. Okay? This is what we mean by an SS lag. Actually, you can see that this can be represented as a conventional AON network because what you can do is you can split up activity U into U1 and U2 and activity V into V1 and V2. So, basically and these are in series. So, U1 and U2 is the activity U and V1 and V2 is the second activity U. So, this is U1 which is the non-common portion. These two activities are in parallel and this is the activity which is subsequently alone after this. So, really speaking it is to accommodate this kind of parallelism that we can use an SS lag. Let us now see what would be the implication of an FF lag. Again, if uh, we were constraining or specifying an FF lag, it would mean that we are saying that from the finish of this activity to the finish of this activity, we are specifying a minimum amount of time, which is the FF lag. And this FF lag will say that from the finish of this to the finish of this, there should be at least this much of difference and uh, it can have the same kind of interpretation for the uh, project. We can uh, have a start to finish lag. A start to finish lag would mean that from the start of this activity to the finish of the second activity, this particular duration is what we call the start to finish lag. And this particular lag, start to finish lag, and you could specify a value of this. So, knowing this, you can compute what time this can uh, finish and from there you can then compute what time this can start at the earliest. So, this is the SF lag <coughs> and uh, the we can have the other uh, finish to start lag. That is what we conventionally use in AON networks. From the finish of this activity to the start of this activity, this particular interval of time could be specified as a finish to start lag. That means one particular activity is now, we are now saying, you see it is like trying to say that rather than introduce a separate activity like you can do here for this big thing. If you have finished this activity, but you would like this to be heated, this to be cooled for a certain amount of time before you can do further operations on this, you can specify a finish to start lag for the activity. Right. So, what we have specified is that these are the four kinds of lags which can be used and we can perform in fact a, a basic computation, uh, computations on uh, the project network by using these kinds of computations. Let us take an example of a project network which is a PDM network. Okay. Now, what happens in this particular network is that we have the activities which are shown here. A, B, D, E, C, F, G, etc. And uh, this is the various kinds of lag, lead lag factors are shown here. Like between A to B, it is an SS lag specifying a value of 3. 
between B to D it is an SF lag of value 4 between B to E it's an FF lag of value 5 and so on right so let us try to do a basic forward pass and a backward pass on this particular network and see what the results would be what the logic is very simple the only thing is that for each activity you would try to find out in a forward pass the uh, early start by the various constraints and the most constraining constraint will actually determine the forward pass for instance let us start the computations here let's try to determine the early start so I'll put the early start a is the starting activity so early start for this activity is 0 I'm putting them on the left hand corner of each box this is the early start of the activity obviously the early finish of this activity is going to be 0 plus 10 is 10 so early start and early finish for this particular activity is 10 now notice something interesting let's look at activity C to begin with activity C has a finish to finish lag with regard to activity A which means that this is 10 so 10 is the finish of this particular activity from the finish of this 10 plus 2 that means this particular activity must finish not earlier than 12 days right so if it finishes at 12 it has a duration of 20 it will start much earlier than this yes. so what we can say is uh, it will be later but since the project starts this so we can say that the earliest start for this particular activity will be 0 right and if the earliest start is 0 this particular activity will finish at 20 and that does not violate this constraint because this constraint says that it must finish uh, later than time 12 so it finishes now at time 20 by virtue of the fact that the project starts at time 0 okay so we have determined the early start and early finish for a job C let's look at job B this is constrained here by a SS uh, relationship so the earliest start of B by this will be 0 plus 3 right so we can say that B can start earliest at time 3 and if it starts at time 3 it can finish at time 11 right now let's take job uh, E for instance now job E has two kinds of constraints which are coming into it okay so we can see both if we come from here 10 it says finish to start uh, has a time of 0 so the earliest that this can start by virtue of this particular constraint is 10 whereas if you see here this is uh, finishing at time 11 and it says finish to finish so this must finish at time 11 plus 5 is 16 16 minus 12 is 4 so this is 4 and the earliest uh, start that you get from this particular relation is 10 so the maximum of the two is 10 so this earliest start is 10 so what we have to simply do is both the constraints if this wasn't we have considered this FF constraint we find that this between this and this this is the dominant constraint and uh, this particular duration is 12 so this particular activity will have a time of 22 that means it will have a uh, finish time if it starts at time 10 it will have a finish time now take activity D here we have a start to finish lag let's say start to finish lag means that from 3 uh, it starts at uh, 3 from the start of this to the finish of this so finish we are saying that this should take place not earlier than time 7 so this means when it takes place at time 7 it has a duration of 6 so it can be it must start at 1 and it must start at finish at 7 we can do this way now you are noting something very interesting this is an activity which is shown following this and yet in terms of the schedule it will uh, be in parallel and it will start earlier than this and will in fact finish earlier than this activity so this is a feature of PDM networks this can happen now let us take activity F when you take activity F what is the earliest start of this particular activity the earliest start of this particular activity we work out from here this finishes at 7 and finish to start uh, lag is 0 so this means from this particular we can start earliest at 7 but here two constraints are specified 
there is an SS lag of 2. So SS lag of 2 means it can start earliest at 12. That's one thing. And at the same time, there is an FF lag of 5. So when there is an FF lag, it means that 10 plus 5, which is 15, uh, sorry, it is finish to it is finish to finish lag. 22 plus 5 is 27. Now 27 minus uh, 14 is 13. So out of all the three, 13 is the largest value, right? So the earliest start of this particular activity is 13. So we have computed from all these. This was 7. This was uh, 12. And from the FF lag, all these three possibilities. This is 13. So this project will will finish at time 27 from that point of view. Now here SS is equal to 3. Uh, so it has again there are three constraints coming on activity G, right? So as far as activity G is concerned, this is a finish to start lag. So that means uh, the start of this must be at least 11 from this particular thing. And this says 13 plus 3, it must be 16, which is higher. And from this particular stage, it is 10. So which is the highest of all the three? So the start time for this will be 16 and then the duration is 2 and then this is 18. So we have now completed the forward pass. So what do you see is, what is the project duration? Yeah, here is an interesting thing that you find that the project duration for this particular example is the maximum of these times really and it is 27 and it is occurring for activity F and yet there is an activity G which is succeeding this activity but it has those kinds of other kinds of uh, lead lag relationships and in fact it concludes much earlier than this particular activity. So this is the basic uh, idea of performing a forward pass for this particular example. Now what can be done is that uh, we can also do a backward pass by a similar logic. Uh, you have to consider all the constraints but for initialization what you do is these are the two terminal activities. So what you will do is you will put 27 here and 27 here. That is the latest finish time of all these activities will be taken as 27. So if you put 27 here, we 27 here, we have this. And if you continue this process, you find that uh, the late finish time of this is 27. And the late start time of this particular activity is 7. And similarly, for this particular activity, this is going to be 13. And let us say for activity D, this is going to be 13 here and it's going to be 7 here. And then you can compute for activity E, it will be 22 here and 10 here. And if you compute for activity B, it will be 17 here and 9 here. And finally for activity A, you would get 0 and 10. So this is exactly in the same manner. We are working backwards and uh, for 27, this would be 27 minus 2, which will be 25. So the numbers in red here show the latest start, latest finish and the numbers in black show the early start and the early finish for various activities. I have assumed in this example that all the activities cannot be split, right? But there is a possibility that activities may be allowed to split and in that case you can obtain different kind of situation. Now you see here that the, which are the three critical activities? The three critical activities in this case are a, E and F, A, E and F and yet the addition of their durations does not give you 27. That is another interesting thing in this example. If you draw a Gantt chart for the problem, what we find is that in this particular case, the critical path is A, E and F. A, then E, it goes like this and then F. See, because there is a finish to finish relationship between this which determines this, so this is actually F is finish critical. So A and B added up and then part of this is in parallel. So the total duration is 27, but they do not add up to the uh, project duration as was the case in the conventional AON networks. So I think this is one feature which is common to all precedence diagramming. That is because of the overlap of activities. So in this particular lecture, we have uh, looked at the AON network as an alternative to the AOA network. And we have found that the AON network gives us a simplified representation. 
it has an activity rather than an event orientation there are no float anomalies it permits expanded relationships of the type SS, SF, FF, FS however it lacks intuitive workflow interpretation that's one of the things that we have seen then we have done basic scheduling with AON networks we can see that the computations can be performed on the network or equally comfortably in a table if you retain for instance in a forward pass the uh, set of predecessors and the successors of the activity then you can calculate in a table tabular form we have seen how to do a forward pass a backward pass total float computations and the identification of the critical part and the computations of the safety free and independent floats directly from the whole uh, situation and finally we have seen some extensions to precedence diagramming methods where we have considered these four types of lags the start to start lag the finish to finish lag the start to finish lag and the finish to start lag and we have taken examples to illustrate these procedures thank you